happy to be joined by Katie Milkman. Katie Milkman, thank you for joining us. You've been on a fairly extensive and busy virtual book tour recently. How, is that true, Katie? I think you've probably been asked every, every question you could have been asked about <laughs> I'm sure there, were, there are some that I haven't been asked. Please, Katie, please allow me a moment to mute all. Yeah, I'm and I'm then, uh, once I've mute all, I'm going to uh, unmute the two of you to ensure there's no disturbance. Oh, man, let me take man. All yours, Katie and Louise. Okay, and we're back in business. So, for people who don't know Katie, she is a behavioral scientist at the University of Pennsylvania, the Wharton School, and it's definitely worth going on to the Wharton School page to see loads of other details. Katie does the uh, Behavior Change for Good initiative. I don't think there's talks at the moment, but there was a spring session of talks. Anyone can sign into them. I've signed into them. They're absolutely fantastic. I really recommend that. She also hosts Choiceology, the podcast, and of course she is the author of the book that we are talking about today, How to Change. You can see all my little <laughs> post-it notes in there, Katie. And uh, in there, a lot of you, uh, we have behavioural scientists in the group, Katie, a lot of behavioural science enthusiasts, and a lot of you reading that will see information that you're familiar with. Um, limitations of gamification, signing pledges, temptation bundling. I loved reading the temptation bundling section, Katie, because I'd put a photo up of myself set up ready to read noise and it had the coffee cup, it had a piece of cake on a plate, uh, my pens or my post-it notes. So maybe we'll kick off, Katie, and for uh, members who aren't so familiar with temptation bundling, let's talk about that a little bit. Sure. Shall I describe it? Absolutely. All right. I wasn't totally sure how you wanted me to kick it off. All right. I would love to talk about this. This is one of my favorite topics that I've studied. And actually, it's kind of, it was my starter project in a way that got me into the topic of behavior change because it was driven by my own life problems. So I, as a graduate student at Harvard, was studying computer science and business, and I had a lot of classes that were hard. <laughs> and they had problem sets that were not that fun to do, and I realized I had a couple of problems. One, I was, I was stressed out. Two, I would come home from class, and all I wanted to do was just curl up on the couch and binge watch TV or read novels because that's my other favorite form of entertainment. And um, I didn't want to get to my homework. And I also could not drag myself to the gym, which I knew was really important to my stress levels and well-being. I'm one of those people who, if I don't exercise, if I don't get my workout in, I'm a mess. But I, I was just too tired at the end of the day. So I, was, I wasn't doing any of the things I needed to be doing. It wasn't going well. And I came up with a solution to my problem, which was, I now call it temptation bundling. I started only letting myself indulge in the entertainment I was craving at the gym. So I would only get to, I started doing audiobooks. Watching TV ended up being too much sensory input for me while bouncing around. I think my brain doesn't go that fast. So I, I started listening to books like The Hunger Games and Harry Potter and uh, the Alex Cross series, but only at the gym. And what it did is at the end of a long day, suddenly I found I was craving trips to the gym to find out what happened next in my latest thriller. Um, time would fly while I was there. And I stopped wasting time at home on on entertainment because I'd come home after I'd gotten my fix and I was ready to get my work done and my stress levels went, went down. And I started doing better in my classes. It was just this like magical formula and it was so effective for me. I thought maybe this is actually a broader idea. Maybe I should study it. I did research on it showing that if you um, either give people free audiobooks and the insight to temptation bundle in one study, or if you give them free audiobooks that they can only access at the gym and, and you actually hold the audiobooks hostage there so they can only hear them while they're working out. Either, either strategy increases exercise. So if you hold them hostage, it's really better. We saw that that increased exercise about 50% for seven weeks in one study we ran. Um, so I think it's broader than, than a technique for helping you go to the gym, right? You can temptation bundle lots of different 
things. So some people have told me they temptation bundle snacks that they love with going to the library to study. Uh, you can temptation bundle by listening to your favorite podcast all, only while you're doing household chores or cooking home cooked meals. Uh, there's lots of different ways to do it. One student once told me she got herself to write her dissertation by only letting herself burn her favorite scented candles while she was working on it. And that somehow made the experience really enjoyable. And so, you know, I think everybody has to pick their bundles appropriately, but that's the basic idea. That's fantastic, Katie. And it's so interesting hearing you start it by talking about your own problems because of course. I think we've lost. The person uh, just doesn't lost. understand me or this person's so perfect. So it's, it's, it's almost comforting to hear that you have exactly the same problems and you're not superhuman, Katie. So not, not even you, remotely. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that uh, you spent a lot of time on was developing the fresh start opportunities and how important it is uh, to uh, almost label the, the time when you start a project. And it goes far beyond just the concept of the New Year's resolution. So maybe just talk a little bit about that, Katie. Yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, this idea of fresh starts was, and, and studying it, which I've done with my amazing former PhD student, Heng Chen Dai, who's now a professor at UCLA, and also with Jason Reese, who is a, a CEO of a company called Behavioralize. It, it came out of a visit I made to Google about a decade ago, where I gave a talk about a bunch of different tools that companies could use, HR groups could use to nudge employees towards better decisions that would be, you know, improve their health and wellness, improve their productivity and so on. And I got this fantastic question, which was, is there some ideal time to offer up tools and promote change to nudge our employees towards taking up the kinds of programming that will help them with self-improvement? And I thought it was such a great question because I hadn't seen an answer in the literature and it was so obvious immediately that, you know, our motivation does ebb and flow. There are moments when we're more willing to, to leap at an opportunity to make a change and other moments when you know we have no interest at all. So uh, the first thing that came to mind when I thought about what are what's a moment when we'd be particularly open to change is something that had already been well established that we all know about, which is New Year's and the New Year's resolution effect, if you wanna call it that. But what Heng Chen and Jason and I started talking about was that there's actually a broader set of dates that share a lot of the key features that New Year's has. So New Year's, one of the reasons it changes our motivation, besides the fact that it's now like a cultural phenomenon and we all talk about it and you have to answer people's questions about what are your New Year's resolutions. But besides that, one of the reasons psychologists think it matters is that um, the way we think about our lives is not completely continuous. Instead, we think about our lives like they have chapters, like we're characters in a, a story. And New Year's is a chapter break for all for us in many ways. It feels like the, the close of one chapter, one year ends and a new one begins. And so with that sense of a new beginning comes a, a sense of dissociation from whatever happened in the last year. Like that was the old me in the old chapter. This is the new me, the new me can do it. So you can dismiss your failings as those of someone else and feel more distanced from them and more optimistic about what you can achieve. And you're also more likely to step back and think big picture about your goals. So what we realized is there's many dates that have a similar psychology around them from the start of a new week, which you know, opens in a, sm a small, maybe a sub chapter in life um, or a new month or the celebration of a birthday, even the celebration of some holidays that we associate with new beginnings. So think more, you know, depending on where you are in the world, the holidays that have those associations will differ. But in the US, there are things like Labor Day um, and less things like Valentine's Day. And so what we've established in our research is that at those moments, actually, we see natural upticks in how frequently people do things that are goal aligned, like search for the term diet on Google, visit the gym, uh, and set goals on popular goal setting webs websites about everything from their health to their finances to their education. So that, that's really the idea behind the fresh start effect. And we think it's also, I should say it's broader than calendar dates. I think at this moment as we're 
again, it depends where you're joining from in the world. In the United States at this moment, we're starting to feel a sense that the COVID-19 pandemic is receding and a lot of businesses are reopening. A lot of people are starting to think about going back to work or to school. And that is certainly a new beginning to an extent. And I hope you know everyone around the world will experience that sooner rather than later. Obviously there are some places where it's still very much ongoing, um, but there are a lot of moments in life that have, have this fresh start potential. Thanks so much, Katie. It's just a great introduction to two of the very many subjects that you cover in the book. Now I'm going to hand over to my co-host Prakash, who's going to have a chat, and then we will be opening up for questions from the members. Thanks, Katie. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Uh, I have, uh, I can see a lot of people joining from different corners from the world. I can see people from Indonesia, uh, Singapore, I see some folks from, a lot of folks from India, uh, Europe, both Central as well as Eastern Europe, Africa, I can see a couple of folks from Latin America, US and Canada. Uh, for folks who have joined in a bit late out here, uh, you all know who is Katie, uh, Professor Ed Wharton, uh, host of Choiceology, Behavior Change for Good, and now, uh, you know, this lovely book. And what are we discussing here today? I think I want to take exactly one moment out here to highlight this particular tweet, which went viral on the 18th of January uh, by some lady called Kenzie. And she said, yesterday I copied the chore. I've been putting off for like five months, took me 20 minutes. I learned nothing from this. And you got insane amount of close to a million likes on, on this, right? So what's going on? And uh, this brings us to, um, Katie, and this is our 33rd, I think, session here today at the Behavioral Science Club. As Katie has also mentioned in her book, in the last couple of years, the last decades, two decades, behavioral science has become quite popular. We know a lot more about ourselves, how we do things. And yet, we don't seem to be able to bring behavioral science into our lives to bring in changes. And why is that so? Uh, Louis already helped us touch two important I think with the fresh start and with the temptation bundling, I, I want to take uh, Katie back to almost the beginning of her book. See the story about Andre Agassi. And for all of us out here, 85 people who are in this room right now, we all struggle with change because change is hard. But let's, let's hear the story of what happened to Andre Agassi and was change easy for him? And what can we learn from that, <laughs> Katie? I don't know if change was easy for Andre Agassi, but I do love this story. And by the way, I think one of the fun things just to share about writing this book, I think, so this is my first book and maybe my last book, we'll see. Uh, but I had no concept of how a book is written. My vision would be like, you write the first chapter and then the second chapter and then the third chapter and then the fourth chapter and then the fifth chapter and then you finish the book. Uh, but books like time, are, <laughs> we don't think about them linearly. We don't create them uh, linearly. Time, we don't have that. Uh, it doesn't have that feature yet. But this book, I wrote all the chapters and then I went back and wrote the introduction, which tells the story of Andre Agassi. So that was actually the last component, which was really fun. And it's probably my favorite part of the book. I'm a tennis player, it's my background. I played in college. So it was really fun to get to tell the story of one of my favorites, one of the greats. Okay, so the story is this. Uh, Andre Agassi was in the 1990s, uh, not doing very well. You, you know his name if you know of him as a, as a star, one of the greatest tennis players of all time. But in 1993, roughly, things were not going so well. So uh, he had been identified at a really young age as having tremendous potential. He grew up with a, a group of other hugely talented American male athletes. Uh, Pete Sampras, Jim Courier, Michael Chang were all competing at, at the same time. They all sort of grew up, trained together. And everyone thought Agassi had more talent, but he was ranked about 30th in the world. And these other folks were in the top slots and he just kept performing worse and worse. And he had gotten a lot of attention because he was this flashy player. He wore you know, ripped jeans to tennis tournaments, lipstick, earrings, long hair, and he'd been in these Canon ads saying image is everything, but his career was really not going as planned. So we had this really 
seminal dinner, pivotal moment in his career where he just lost his coach. His coach had, had left him. He found out about it by reading a newspaper headline and didn't even get a phone call. And he has a dinner with a, a new potential coach and that's Brad Gilbert. So Brad Gilbert was another pro player who was not, most would say terribly talented, but one and did much better on the tour than anyone ever believed he should have. And he had written a best-selling book earlier that year before they had this dinner called Winning Ugly. That was all about the mental tactics he used to outsmart his opponents and win when we sort of had no right to based on his ability. So at this dinner, Brad Gilbert says to Andre Agassi, if if I had the skills you have, you know, I, I would be number one in the world. Like you're wasting your skills. And he gives him a lecture on, on what he's doing wrong. And the, and the key point he makes is that Andre Agassi is too focused on himself, that he's not focused enough on his opponent when he gets out on the court. He goes out and he tries to hit winners on every shot. He's not trying to think through what are the weaknesses of my opponent? How do I exploit them? How can I de develop a strategy that will allow me to, to win as opposed to, or even let the other person lose, as opposed to always having to hit these big shots and, and succeed on my, own, on my own strengths? So this was a turning point for Agassi. He was, he recognized himself immediately in it. Uh, Gilbert accepted the job of becoming his coach. And he went on to play in the U S open later that year, using this new strategy, he enters unseated because he's had such a rough run and ends up winning the whole tournament, which is a history book type of event. You know, no one who was unseated, meaning expected not to perform in the top 16 players no one unseated had won the tournament in decades and he goes on to become number one in the world and hold that ranking for over 100 weeks uh, and the key insight was just understanding who are you against what's your opponent outsmarting it the reason I talk about that in a book about change because is that uh, I, I have found in working with individuals and organizations that one of the biggest mistakes we make when trying to change is really the same mistake Agassi made in tennis, which is playing sort of a one size fits all strategy, not sizing up the opponent you're facing and being thoughtful about what's the right tactic and technique to use in order to win. Uh, but when we actually do figure out what we're up against, what our opponent is and the battle to change, we can, we can get a lot farther. And science has all sorts of great insights about tactics that work, but we have to understand what's the barrier. So in, in terms of change, the way I laid out the book is breaking down some of the most common barriers from the, the challenge of just motivating yourself to get started. And that's really where the fresh start effect comes in to challenges of uh, impulsivity and procrastination to laziness or inertia, uh, to forgetting and and um, and so that's that's really I think so important that if we just use sort of like a you know set big audacious goals or visualize success type strategy and we don't actually think through or figure out what are we up against is this a self confidence problem is it a forgetting problem is it a an impulsivity problem we won't use the tactics that are going to set us up for success to make change. Uh, th that was a, a fantastic uh, story of Agassi and how he goes on to become a, a world number one for almost, I think, 101 weeks. Um, so uh, I, I want to continue this theme further. Uh, in the sense, we all know a little bit of behavioral science by now. We already knew we feel uh, because such is the nature of this whole uh, field. Uh, but then we've also read books. We know things and yet we're not able to bring in changes because uh, change is hard for everyone. But like you say in your book, the question more than why it is hard is not realizing it's a different strategy for each one of us. Not everything works for everyone and there are more nuances to it. So I want to bring the story of uh, add a spoonful of uh, sugar, a, a drop of medicine to a spoonful of sugar. What does it mean for us? Uh, and for folks who are already here out here, please feel free to exchange your LinkedIn ideas or Twitter with each other, make new friends. And also start sharing a question in the chat box because I think we should start up uh, the Q&A. It's only fair. You are here. Uh, so is Katie. But Katie, before that, a spoonful of sugar and a drop of medicine, what does it really mean? 
Yeah, so this is the famous um, song from Mary Poppins, right? That uh, And it, by the way, comes from, there's this wonderful story, Bob Sherman, who is the lyricist who put together the songs in this wonderful children's movie, was looking for a new punchy song that would get Julie Andrews, who is a famous actress, to sign on and agree to play this title role. She hadn't yet agreed, and they needed a great, a great song. And his son had to get a polio vaccine, which is very relevant today, and he was worried, he heard his son came home and he knew he'd had the vaccine. He was worried it might've been very painful. And he said, you know, was it rough? How did it go? And his son said, oh, it was fine. They just put it on a drop of, of sugar or a spoonful of sugar. And it, you know, went right down because it was a, a vaccine you took orally. And that's where the idea came from. Like, oh, if we can sweeten the medicine, it's a pleasure instead of a, a pain. And then the song that he composed, of course, says, you know, just a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down and it's about making things more fun finding ways to to make your chores enjoyable and really the reason i talk about that in the book is that when it comes to overcoming the challenge of impulsivity which is that often it's not fun it's a chore to do things that are good for us in the long run one of the key insights from behavioral science research and really out of research by Ayelet Fishbach and Caitlin Woolley, you Chicago and Cornell researchers, is that we think we'll be able to follow Nike's advice and just do it. And that, you know, if something isn't fun in the moment, if it's a chore, we'll, we'll be able to focus on why it's important and, and push through. But what their research shows is that people who take that approach, who just try to do things, you know, grin and bear it in the most effective way possible, don't get very far on their goals. They quit quickly because if the experience itself isn't instantly gratifying, you give up because we we focus, we overweight present value and underweight the long-term rewards in general as it's a, it's a feature of human nature. So their work has shown that if you actually encourage people to find ways to make it more fun to pursue their goals, they persist much longer. They persist longer. And you know, if they choose a different way to go to the gym, by the way, temptation bundling is an example of a spoonful of sugar. But if you, if you choose a different activity even, which is what they've studied more. So you go to the gym and you pick Zumba class instead of a punishing machine, you persist longer. If you um, are in a math class doing math worksheets and your teacher provides ways to make it fun by giving you, you know, snacks and, and markers and playing music, most people expect that that will be distracting, but the ki kids actually persist longer in that situation because they're enjoying the work. So when we can find ways and, and healthy eating follows the same model, when we can find ways to add a spoonful of sugar, it really does seem when, it, when we're approaching our own goals to be incredibly valuable. Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, so for folks who are looking in, uh, you know, to uh, maybe pick up a, an exercise habit, maybe think of it not as a walk, think of it as a music session in the park with your headphones on, you change the framing in your mind, it becomes easy for you. Uh, I want to also uh, invite in Louise because she's going to help us with all the Q and A's. For, so guys, please start sharing your question here. And before I go and, uh, you know, we, we start the whole full Q&A, the book is amazing. I put up a, a, a mnemonic out there, not the best of mnemonic, impulsive procrastinators often forget that laziness kills confidence and conformance. What I mean is the book has got these chapters around impulsiveness, procrastination, forgetting, laziness, confidence and conformance, and it ties it all down to bringing change for good. How do you make change last? And the best part is each chapter ends with, with lovely summaries. You know, one week, one month from now, when your memory has become weaker, you can just pick up the book, open it, the, the takeaways, and boom, refresh it. That's what the book is all about. Uh, please get your hands on the book. But for now, Louise, please help us with the Q&A. Thanks so much, Prakash. Um, and thank you, everyone, for your questions that have come flooding in. Um, we had an early question there from Priyanka. If you're here, Priyanka, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Hello. So more than a question, it's, it's, it's a lot of questions per se. Um, it's basically asking like as psychologists and social scientists and behavior scientists and just in this field and aware of what we're doing, sort of, sort of aware and sort of acknowledging our own humanity at the same time. Do we make it harder on ourselves to 
just that change, like that awareness, like, and do we drive everyone crazy? And should we approach change in our lives differently? And any specific techniques for us who possibly over intellectualize our own emotions? I often find myself completely at loss. So. Yeah. yeah, I don't think it puts you at a disadvantage. In fact, I mean, I think the central argument of, of the book is that by being, I'll call it sophisticated, and I'm using that term, I'm borrowing it from the economics literature from, you know, Matt Rabin and Ted O'Donoghue have written about this concept of appreciating our own limitations as a form of sophistication. So, you know, I don't mean to imply that we're better than other people. I'm just, I'm just borrowing from their terminology. But if you think of, of understanding yourself as a form of sophistication, then that's what this book is all about. Once you understand what are the barriers, what are the limits, you have this incredible power because you can go and try to match the right tools to those problems. So I don't think it's a, dis, you know, a, a disadvantage. It's quite the opposite. I think it should be an advantage, you know, especially if you couple it with a knowledge of the science on what works then given those limitations. I, I will say, I think that it can be more tricky when it comes to the other people in our lives who were, you know, our spouses, I don't know if you can hear my husband is vacuuming right now. I think he doesn't know I'm in a book club, so I'm sorry for the background noise, but I think I'm speaking of him. Uh, you know, he finds it annoying when I'm like, oh, look, you're just exhibiting the planning fallacy and we should do things differently, right? It's It can be annoying to other people when we always have a scientific answer for what, the, you know, we're labeling their bias and we're prescribing solutions. So I think that's where it can be trickier more than the self-help component. And that's where we we need like a bit more EQ and probably less labeling of the problem and more of an artful use of some of these technique, techniques to try to be helpful to people, right? And, and recognize, okay, if we see the limitation, maybe naming it and telling them what bias they're exhibiting is going to create, you know, walls and self-defense. And instead, we could just use what we've learned to try to be effective and coaching them in the right direction. Thanks, Priyanka, for that good question. Thank you, Katie. Uh, and Joanne Griffin has a question, which is, this is something I suffer desperately from. Joanne, would you like to put your question forward? Uh, thanks, Louise. Hi, Katie. Um, so when we think about inertia, which is, you know, that inability to move ahead despite wanting to, um, I've seen this in my teams when they say, you know, we're going through a change program, and I'd say to them, you know, are you with the change? Are you for the change? And there's absolutely no resistance. They are 100% uh, on board. But then just like memory foam, they sit back at their desks and they sink into the chair and there's nothing to propel them forward. So there's a lack of progress. Um, and I don't know if it's related to the intention action gap or, you know, how do you see that inertia and how do you shift people out of that zone? Yeah, it's a great question. When I think about what in the book feels most relevant to that kind of challenge, someone who's open to change, but is lacking in sort of the motivation to actually make the change. There are a few things that come up. One is, um, one, one idea is actually the power of commitment devices, because what, what a commitment device does is it's a tool that changes your incentive structure and creates much larger incentives to um, move forward. If you're if you're not feeling motivated enough, it creates that extra motivation. So a commitment device, we're, we're very familiar with when someone else imposes rules and incentives on us, right? Like you get a speeding ticket from the government if you drive too fast. Like we, we get that, that makes sense. And, and that's like in our own interest, it's an in interest of society to be stopped if we're going too fast. But um, but we feel really differently about it. And it feels really counterintuitive when we start thinking about would we impose those kinds of fines or rules on ourselves? But that's exactly what a commitment device does. It basically takes the insight that, yeah, speeding tickets work. If you're gonna get fined, you're less likely to speed. And if you have a goal and you know you're gonna just sit back in the memory foam, as you said, and, and get comfortable there, and uh, even though you're committed to it, you can up the ante and make it less likely you'll put off, procrastinate on whatever it is you know you should be doing uh, and get comfortable in your old ways by basically um, putting a price on your vices. So I think a commitment device would be a very good tool to use in that situation. And with kids, you know, what, what's the right commitment device? They probably don't have like a lot of money they can be putting on the line. That's one kind of commitment device where you literally put money on the line. You choose a referee that they um, will report to say a website 
like a stick or a bee minder, these websites that help you create commitment contracts on whether you succeed. And then the money will be donated to charity of your choice if you fail. And by the way, you can pick your poison. So if the charity might be a silver lining, if you fail to achieve your goal, you can choose a charity you hate. And they have charities on either side of hot button issues. Like, you know, in the US, you, maybe gun, gun control and uh, and a charitable organization like the NRA, which is the National Rifle Association, that's the gun lobby. So you can pick uh, what, what would what would pain you the most if your money went there. With a kid, that's a little bit funny, right? Because kids may not want to put their money on the line. And it might be that as a strategy of parenting, you work with them to decide on some boundaries or some penalties that they agree will help motivate them so it's a, an opt-in rather than you imposing it on them, but then you can be the referee, right? So you can agree like, all right, we're not going to have movies on the weekends anymore unless, or your allowance will be docked unless. What do you want it to be? What would really motivate you? And, and we agree to those terms. So I think that's a way to think about it. Yeah, so what do I think about it in terms of habit formation? It's kind of dialing up the motivation as much as possible. Um, yes, and there's other tactics that they, if the way you're framing it in terms of thinking it's bad habits, then if you dial up the motivation, you may want to couple it with some of the tactics that we know are effective. Like how can, you know, what is it that they're committing to? Is it just a different, you know, behavior on a daily basis? And then that is associated with some penalty or reward, or is it that, uh, you know, you want to try to use some of these tactics like piggybacking and, and, and um, which is, you know, trying to put one habit on top of another. Uh, it, it sort of depends on what, what kind of habit they're trying to form, but there are also techniques in addition to just upping the ante that you can use that will help put something more on autopilot. Yeah, thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Joanne. Um, Shrutin, you have a question you'd like to put to Katie. Thanks, Lou. Uh, hi, Katie, it's been a wonderful session so far. Uh, I think the mention of uh, you know, the fresh start concept and uh, the tweet that Prakash shared uh, just got me thinking about uh, this time from engineering where uh, I think a similar uh, kind of milestone or whatever you'd call it, these markers, where when you're studying for an exam, you know, you'd be like, okay, maybe I'll start at five o'clock and then, you know, it's 10 past five and then you're like, maybe I'll start at six o'clock and so on. And then I found myself doing something similar, you know, with work where, uh, you know, if you want to mail somebody, uh, reach out to a company or something, uh, you know, just mentally you'd make this thing that, okay, maybe I should mail them on a Monday or a Tuesday. And then if you miss that, you find yourself kind of wasting the next few days waiting for the next Monday or Tuesday. So, uh, so in fact, I just want to ask you how effective, uh, you know, the fresh start concept is on a shorter uh, term, so to speak, because what I've been working on, you know, personally is trying to get rid of that where, uh, you know, if I feel that something is important, but uh, I'm almost past the deadline, you know, that mental deadline of, you know, beginning of the week or beginning of the month, then I still try and, you know, just get it done whenever I think of it so that, you know, you don't have to just keep in that infinite loop, uh, you know, kind of like the tweet that I shared. Uh, so, any, any uh, thoughts or views on, you know, how it can be made effective in the short term or have you faced similar challenges with people finding it, you know, pushing it to the next deadline and then it gets into a kind of infinite loop? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, the, I think, you know, that's basically the, the nature of procrastination, right? And so uh, it's a very common challenge because it, there's always something else that would be more fun than doing that chore. And so you like, later becomes a very appealing answer. I think actually the best solution for procrastination is to create deadlines that have teeth, which is very related to what Joanne was just asking about, right? So commitment devices are one way you can prevent procrastination, but you might want to think about also um, simply using planning. So planning prompts, plans that involve cues. So you uh, choose a date and time when you say you're going to do something, you can make it public, you can make yourself accountable, like put money on the line on a commitment device website, or you can okay. just, uh, by the way, it's, it's weaker, but you can just tell someone else or, you know, like a boss or a, a partner, someone whose opinion you care about. And, uh, and you can even just tell yourself and you'll feel worse about 
not doing it if there's a specific date and time when you said you'd do it in a certain way, because now you're breaking an explicit commitment to yourself as opposed to a vague one. So I do think, you know, really concrete planning deadlines and imposing any kinds of penalties you feel comfortable imposing on yourself is a tactic that's really useful in terms of procrastination. There's a, uh, there's, let me say there's a study, actually, one of my favorite studies that's by Dan Ariely that looks at this. It's actually, uh, it was done almost 20 years ago now. That's just a really simple study with college students at MIT and either letting them choose their own deadlines or uh, having no deadlines for course assignments or imposing deadlines that are evenly spaced on them. And there's sort of two interesting things about the study. One is that when people can self-impose deadlines that'll have real penalties, uh, a lot of them choose to, which an economist would say like, why would you ever do that? But someone who understands the self-control challenges that we all face would appreciate if you don't set deadlines on yourself, you may procrastinate on the work, it'll stack up the end of the semester and you'll turn in lower quality assignments. And indeed, that's exactly what they find that people who have no deadlines underperform those who have deadlines imposed on them and underperform the kinds of people who, um, who get to set deadlines because which falls in the middle because only about half actually do it. But if you take up that opportunity to set deadlines, it's helpful. And so that group with the option of setting deadlines with teeth, with penalties, ends up outperforming a group that has no way of setting deadlines uh, that could matter. So anyway, that's, that's some research that I think is very related to this issue of procrastination in addition to the planning process. Thanks, Shurton. Great Thank question, Shurton. Thank you. Thank you. And um, there's been quite a lot of agreement of question that Nirja put forward. I'm going to call it out myself, Nirja, if you don't mind. I'm just trying to race through as many questions as we can. Nirja and several others are interested in change when it's at scale, Katie, not just our own change, but when we come in as a change within an organization, which is very challenging. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, what's interesting is almost all of the research in the book and almost all of the research on change, in fact, it's hard to probably, it would be the exception, is done to try to create group change. It's, you know, individuals changing, but individuals in a group, so many people changing at once. So that is, uh, that's the way almost everything is studied, is a large group who isn't exercising regularly or isn't, you know, saving enough for retirement at an organization. And then these tactics are applied like we we recognize oh okay procrastination is a challenge or okay it seems like maybe this group needs a planning prompt and then all the tactics that we know we can turn on ourselves that that's really the book is more focused on that but the same things work right trying to help people make it more fun to change trying to help people make plans where they think through the date and time when they need to do something so it'll be harder to procrastinate and we maybe um, make them accountable to someone else. Those kinds of things are just as effective in groups as they are for individuals. But the other thing I wanna say is that there's a chapter where I really focus on social norms and peer effect. And I think those are incredibly important to consider as tools of change when you're thinking about a group. So, so a really basic finding that's very, you know, it, we've known this for a long time is that if you are surrounded by people who are behaving in a certain way, you're more likely to behave that way too. So, you know, Solomon Ash studied this in the 1950s, looking at trying to understand what happened during the Holocaust, but it's, you know, been replicated and studied for decades and decades since. It's so robust. For instance, I love the study showing that your college roommate, if you go, you end up in college and you're randomly assigned to a roommate, if they're a better student, you end up performing better in school. So because we're so shaped by the groups we're in, that's another really important thing to keep in mind and take in into account if you're thinking about trying to create group change or if you're in a group and you're wondering how the group can change. Uh, so, so those dynamics are really important and trying to get everyone bought in, everyone on board is critical or else right, if you don't have that social norm, if you don't have that propellant, it can be a challenge. Um, it also speaks to the importance if you are trying to make a change of, of looking to surround yourself with other people of similar goals and who are making progress so that you will you'll be swept up and lifted up by the people around you rather than brought down. Thank you, Katie. I think that really pulls us back to our book last week when we were talking about You're Invited, how important it is to surround yourself with good people. Uh, so, Katie, um, 
there's a question here which I think segues very well into the chapter on gamification. Chrislene is asking, can humour and fun backfire or be ineffective? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, what so? When I was writing How to Change, my editor asked a similar question because I had sort of written about Ayelet and Caitlin's wonderful work on the power of making it fun. And it was very focused on how the individual can create change, how the individual, if they look for a fun way to pursue a goal, will persist longer. But I, the, this great question came up of sort of, can it ever backfire? And, and what if what if someone else is trying to impose the fun on you? And it led me to have a really interesting series of conversations with some scholars, actually at Wharton, who've studied gamification, which is not a topic I knew a lot about, but that's when an organization tries to make, say, your job more fun, or maybe an app more fun by adding bells and whistles that you'd normally add to a game, you know, leaderboards, points, levels, all of the things that we associate with playing, you know, Monopoly or a computer game instead of doing our jobs or achieving our goals. And uh, Ethan Mollick is the person I talk to the most. He's a, he's a professor of the management department at Wharton who studied gamification a lot. And what he sort of taught me about the findings is that the general discovery is that adding those bells and whistles can make work more fun, but only really if people are bought into whatever whatever the game is and whatever the goal is. So if you are feeling manipulated by your employer, it's not fun, right? And uh, if it, you're gonna feel like this is mandatory fun and it's not gonna work. And if the game is a dud and it's a bit of an art to create games that aren't, that also is not going to be effective because now it's not fun, right? So it's it's hard. This is a tricky one to use when, when you're trying to motivate other people. It seems to work much better and be more natural when people are opting in to playing games in order to self-motivate to achieve a goal like learning another language. And so you sign up for Duolingo and people like having the bells and whistles there, but when their employer imposes it on them, it doesn't work so well. So Ethan ran this experiment with salespeople and a game they created that they thought would be fun that involved, you know, calling every sale a different kind of basketball shot and having leaderboards and, and graphics and a champagne bottle you win if you win the prize. And they found that it, it actually backfired and made work less fun for people who found this, you know, annoying and, and driven by management's goals as opposed to um, something they actually enjoyed. It, so it had this like bimodal effect as opposed to some other studies where people were opting in, trying to meet weight loss goals or volunteering for Wikipedia and getting these kinds of bells and whistles. So it's a little bit more complicated. It's a, it's not as straightforward what the answer is on that. And, and I think um, means we have to be much more careful if we're trying to use these principles to shape others' decisions rather than to shape our own goal achievement. Thank you, Katie. Um, Nula, can I bring you in next? Nula's got a rather personal question about the book. Nula. I can't hear you, Nula. I don't know if anyone else can. Can you hear me now? Yep, that's super. Yeah. Go ahead, Nula. Oh, um, well done on the book, Katie. Superb, superb read. Uh, I should tell you that I have tried your temptation bundling. Uh, I did use your Choiceology po podcast and it works. So uh, <laughs> I recommend it. But anyway, um, my question, which isn't that personal, uh, is uh, looking at hindsight bias. In terms of you now looking at the book, and I know it's hard because you're still in the middle of the tour, etc. But what uh, pleased, uh, surprised, and maybe disappointed you about some of the feedback you've got. And I, 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 if I, this might be a personal question, and I hope your husband is still hoovering as I ask this, but how important was Max's feedback for you, given that he features so prominently in the book? When you say how important was his feedback, do you mean feedback on the book? Yes, <laughs> yes, like? point, on the book. Yeah, he gave me wonderful feedback. And actually there was a, a um, wasn't a chapter it was a um it was like a short epilogue that he didn't like and it, it's gone <laughs> so i will say his, his feedback was very important um in hindsight let's see one thing that i struggled with and it's funny that this was mentioned uh one thing i struggled with was adding the chapter takeaways a little bit because i wondered you know i i want i wanted to write a book that didn't feel 
like, you know, here's how to change for dummies. Like, you know, if that makes sense. And even the title already implies that it was going to be a very, uh, very practical. I wanted, I wanted to provide practical tools, but I didn't want to dumb it down to the point where people would feel like it, it was a dummies book. So it was a little bit of a challenge and a struggle to convince myself and for a number of people that I should include those chapter takeaways. And I'm really glad I did, even though I struggled a little with it. People, a lot of people have told me that that was important to them, is valuable to them, that while you know, they liked seeing all the science and the details, having that ability to have something they could refer back to was really important. And it also conveyed that the goal of the book, which really was to be useful while also hopefully entertaining and sharing the details for everybody who's a nerd like me and likes to know about the data, but, um, but also to entertain and, and um, provide that practical value. So, so that's one thing in hindsight. I'll say that the feedback I've gotten in hindsight, that is most frustrating to me is uh, when people say like, oh, it's just all common sense. And I actually was just having a conversation, a call with a couple of um, colleagues because, you know, we know from the studies we did that many of the things that sound like common sense, if you ask people in a survey, you know, what's the right way to approach your goal? Should you look for the most effective way or the most fun way? They all say that, you know, not all, but the vast majority say the most effective way. Uh, and, and that's how most people pursue their goals. But then you tell them, actually, it's the most fun way. And people say, that's common sense. Mm. So think about the, mm. the chapter on elastic habits, you know, 80% of psychologists who we surveyed at top universities thought the best way to create a habit was through these really rigid routines. We proved in our, our science and then I described the work showing um, actually that's wrong, that, that it's really important to have more flexibility built in or else you'll find that your routines are brittle. And again, that sort of gets off in the pushback, like, oh, it's common sense, everybody knows this. But so, so I would say that's the thing that frustrates me most. And it's not a big frustration in a sense. I'm glad that the, the way it's written and the way it's laid out has made it feel like obvious because <laughs> that was the goal is like it should be it should become intuitive and now we understand how the power of fresh starts and if we understand the importance of flexibility and if it's been written in a way that makes it intuitive that's a success but it's frustrating to have some readers say like I didn't need the book I knew it already because I'm like I knew you didn't <laughs> <laughs> not true anyway so thank you for letting me growl for a moment <laughs> but very good uh, <laughs> those are those things it's been an adventure thanks for the great question Thank you, Nula. And yes, that's a great question. It reminds me of the first acknowledgement you give, Katie, at the end, which is when you say that you didn't know how to go about writing a popular book. So it's it's obviously it's a challenge, isn't it, when you're writing for a completely different audience than the audience that you're used to dealing with. And as, as we all agree, you've done a great job. Um, now, Crystal has a question in relation to change in finance, which could probably be a whole session on its own. But uh, would you like to put your question, Crystal? Hi, thank you. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Like I say, it's my first time actually joining. I'm new to the space of behavioral finance or behavioral science, um, but I'm loving it. So Katie, thank you again. I am yet to read, but I definitely will. Um, I, I don't know. I think my question is quite broad, but hopefully you can provide some insight or some thoughts that will help me, you know, in my research and learning. I think a couple of things. So I work with people one-on-one -on -one with their finances. And I just help them through kind of creating a plan and getting confident. And I'm also developing an app. Um, so it'll just be interesting to hear your thoughts on behavioral change in terms of, like you said, the strategy. Uh, because obviously a lot of what I do is first looking at getting people to reflect and then it's about building out a plan about where they want to get to so I don't know if you had any thoughts about the strategy and maybe you, you do go into it in your book that would be interesting or if there's anything in particular that you think actually this might be really worth looking into and I just on the side which you know, fine if, if it's not an answer a question for you on the gamification yes we've been very much so looking at Duolingo don't know if you know that one about the learning very language. well yeah yeah, which I love. Um, and, you know, we, we looked at that a lot with ours. But yeah, I don't know if you have any thoughts on any of that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, what your question is making me think about just some of the biggest takeaways about what works to change behavior when it comes to savings decisions. And so maybe I'll give you like a quick rundown of some of the greatest hit studies that that I like the best in this vein. Um, one has to do with your point on planning, and it's related to the importance of 
breaking goals uh, in that are sort of big and might feel overwhelming into bite-sized chunks, which is that is common sense, but also something that we don't always do. Uh, there's this wonderful study by Hal Hirschfeld out of UCLA and collaborators showing that a behavioral, an, an app, Acorns, ran an experiment where they invited people to either sign up to start saving $5 a day or sign up to save $35 a week or sign up to save $150 a month. And you'll notice those are exactly the same but there's just a simply simple change in the framing. And what they found is a dramatically higher rate at which people were interested in saving when it was framed as a dollar a day, excuse me, as $5 a day, because it felt bite size. Um, so that's one, I think, really important insight about saving. One of the reasons it, it can feel overwhelming when you look at the accumulation, how much you're taking out of a monthly budget or a yearly budget to set aside, people can find that overwhelming and be turned off. When you break it down into what the accumulation is in a day, it feels much more approachable. And so making sure that something feels approachable and not overwhelming can be important in this context. Um, one other study I'll mention that's related to fresh starts, which we talked about earlier that I'm really proud of is a study where we showed that simply inviting people to begin saving following a fresh start date was a way to make it more uh, appealing and it increased savings considerably. So. Some fresh starts we, we jump on naturally, but there's an ability or an opportunity to highlight fresh starts to people. So we ran this experiment with about 2000 employees who were saving inadequately for retirement. Most weren't saving at all. These were four employers. They sort of picked out employees who were either not saving at all or in a few cases saving very, very little. And we sent them mailings and we invited them to start saving and we invited them to save now. Of course, that would be first best, but we recognized many people would want to procrastinate. So we also invited them to save starting in a future date. They could check a box and send and sign a, a form and send a postcard back and we'd take care of the rest. And what we did is we randomized what future date uh, it was and how we framed it. So if two people both had a birthday coming up in say two months, we'd randomly assign one to get an invitation to start saving in two months and the other to get an invitation to start saving after their next birthday. Now, they're an identical offering. They're both in two months, but in one case, we're highlighting this fresh start moment and the other, we're, we're treating it as any other day. Uh, we did this with birthdays. We also did it with the first day of spring. Do you wanna start saving after the beginning, at the beginning of spring? And we found in both cases that the, that framing worked and increased the attractiveness of the offer. So we saw about 30, 20 to 30% more savings in the following eight months and the groups that got an identical offering that simply labeled the date as a fresh start. So that's another insight that I think is useful in this context. And they both have to do with this. It's overwhelming. Saving is one of those things that we can find, wow, it's big, it's scary. But if, if we can do it on the, a moment that feels appropriate and right, okay, I can handle doing this at my next birthday, that's a milestone, I'm ready to make that change, make the leap. If we can make it feel bite-sized, okay, only $5 a day, I can do that, then maybe it's not so overwhelming and more people will achieve their goals. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kristen, thanks, Katie. I think we've got time for just one more question. Um, I'm gonna bring in Jing with her question, which is a little bit more almost philosophical, I think, than anything else, but I, I'd like to hear the answer. Jing, are you still with us to ask your procrastination question? I don't know if you can oh, hear me. Yes, Jing, go ahead. I can read it out if you yes, want. Yes, apologies if my uh, my son starts screaming, um, so I have to put myself on mute. Um, so my question is, because I read Adam Grant's um, book and also watch his TED talk and I know he's a colleague of yours Katie and I haven't read your book so unfortunately like um that's why I don't have questions about your book yet but I would definitely read it so in terms of procrastination I, I know you guys talk about it, it was quite fascinating and uh, I, I know when, when I watched Adam's uh, talk he kind of mentioned that procrastination sometimes is is good for creativity because you know we kind of we need a bit more time to make our ideas a little bit more perfect and so do you have uh, so basically have you done any research in terms of um or any views in terms of what's good procrastination what's not so good negative procrastination that can lead us to you know nowhere <laughs> i love so, that you brought that up that work is done by ji shin who was one of um adam's dissertation students and i was lucky enough to be on her committee as well so know that work very very well and very intimately it's really it's really creative and Jihei is brilliant. Um, she's a professor at the University of Wisconsin. And uh, the key insight there about procrastination is that 
uh, the, the, the benefit of sort of ruminating and then being under the gun and, and, and giving yourself that maximal time to re reach that peak creative moment can have value. But, but it's very specific to creative output, right? And most of the goals we're trying to achieve, some of them involve a creative process, but a lot of the things we've been talking about, like saving more or exercising more regularly, right? Or, and, and so on are different. So I, I think there's lots of merit in the insight that sort of forcing yourself on a rigid schedule. And by the way, this also relates to elastic habits and that rigidity has some, some boundaries and some downsides. It's another downside. When, when you're sort of too rigid and force yourself to do something when you're not ready, when the creative juices aren't flowing, uh, that might not always be optimal, but many of our goals aren't creative in, in nature. And so I think this that it only really applies to that kind of work where we, we might wanna be more open to procrastinating and recognize that, uh, that sitting down and forcing yourself to do something when the moment isn't right, when you don't have the inspiration can be counterproductive. That, that is a really important insight, but it's, it's largely not the case that our goals that we're procrastinating on have that creative feature. Thank you. That's thanks great. so much, Ming. Thank you, thank you. And thank you so much, Katie. And we're coming towards the end of our event today. It's been a fantastic turnout by all of our members. I don't know if they actually prefer a Friday at five o'clock than our usual time. <laughs> so maybe we'll find out from this particular change, Katie. Um, but so I'd really like to thank you for joining us. It's been really interesting. I hope everybody's picked up loads of great tips. And if you like what you heard today, you can buy Katie's book. Um, maybe I something like you I'm might. To... This is the American version. It has different covers in the U.S. and in the and in... yeah, you've got the British version. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> apparently, well, the, apparently the pigeon and swan don't resonate ar everywhere around the world as like an aspirational and uh, less aspirational. Interesting. <laughs> yes, you can see mine, everyone. I have a butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> Something you might like to all do for yourselves is um, after reading Katie's book, I wrote down I, all the times I could remember of major changes in my life. And they're very small, very small number. One of them I can remember was when I learned to turn the tap off when I was washing my teeth. That was because there was a drought in the UK. So that was the reason for that. But all of the other changes I could remember were actually almost foisted upon me, sort of like when we changed a bag because there was a financial levy. Um, I started studying as a stu mature student, but because my youngest daughter started school, sorting our rubbish. I mean, that was a financial levy. So change is very difficult, and I'm sure you won't be able to make a very long list of the number of times you've changed. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Katie. Next week, uh, no Behavioural Science Club tomorrow. Uh, next week, we don't have a guest. I'm going to ask all of you to please contribute. It's coming up to a year since we started Behavioral Science Club. And I'd like to invite members to join us as we did for International Women's Day and maybe just speak for a few minutes about um, what Behavioral Science Club has meant for them over the year or a book that they've enjoyed reading, something that's maybe made a change for them, anything at all. It's going to be a members evening, so we're welcoming you to do that. You can private message me if you would like to be included in the event. So I'm just going to hand over to Prakash now to wrap up and thank you very much indeed, Katie. Thank you for having me. This was so fun. Lovely to meet many of you. <laughs> Uh, thank you all uh, for people who join us from different corners of the world. Thank you for being here. Uh, Louise, Katie, fantastic. Uh, guys, uh, you know, we cover a lot of books. We cover the, the best folks in the world of behavioral science out here. Um, let me just uh, bring up one point out here. Right? Almost all of us know about, you know, a temptation bundling. We knew about a fresh uh, start effect. But where this particular book differs, it's, it's going to tell you, do not have this understanding that a, a fresh start effect is blanket good for everyone. There are times when it can actually backfire, right? And what are those times? So these nuanced understanding, especially because the premise of the book itself is behavioral change is hard because we don't know how to break it in our life. But it's really easy once you understand where to fight, right? So 
the, the blanket knowledge that a fresh start effect is good can sometimes make us do things where it actually wipes out our progress. And what are those cases? I won't tell you, read the book for that. Um, Katie, thank you so much for being here with us. Before you thank go, you. Uh, is there one advice, if you could give us just any one advice uh, you know, for us? Oh, I only get one piece of advice. Um, Why the book is the simplest one, I know. No, I, 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 my favorite insight in the book is the importance of making change fun. I really, we've already talked about it, but I really, I think it's underappreciated how hard it is to get anything done if you aren't enjoying it, how quickly we quit. And um, I'll say one way to make things fun is to make them social. We have this recent study that was run by Rachel Gershon at UCSD that I love showing if you pay people a dollar individually to accomplish a goal each, um, every time they do it, in this case, it was gym attendance, uh, you get far worse results than if you pay people to do it together. Uh, and one of the key reasons was that they found it so much more fun to do things together. And, uh, you know, as we're hopefully able to do more things together, even on Zoom, I think it's a great insight. It's a great way to make life and goals more enjoyable is do them with people who make you have fun. Thank you so much, Katie. To end. Uh, for all of us out here, uh, before you go, stay safe, wear your mask, uh, take care, buy the book. Take care. Thank you for having me. Bye, Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. See you next week. Have fun. And